Uh, one of the things I noticed when you guys were doing your introductions is that um, you're making, uh, you're doing the same thing that everybody does all the time and they flock together with their own group. And if you're going to make partnerships in the community and be able to network with other agencies, which is critical to getting grants and executing them, you need to be able to kind of mix yourselves up and meet other people because the people in this room are great resources to you when you go to write your grant and do services in the community. So at some point today, when you get a chance, you know, change your seating around and sit by somebody you don't know and get to know other people that eventually could be like a really big help to you. Um, you ready? Yes. How many people in here are full-time grant writers at your job? One. How many of you run programs and have to write grants at the same time to sustain your programs? And how many of you are just trying to learn about grants or like you're a total beginner? And the rest of you, why are you here? Is <laughs> <laughs> this, this is a requirement of Joe's uh, grant writing class? Oh, for the free breakfast, free lunch, too? Um, I think that, uh, you know, if you're a program person and you also have to write your own grants, it's a really big challenge. As a, as a grant writer uh, at Aliviana, you know, I had a, a wonderful position where I would write up the grants, they get funded, and I'd hand them off to the program people and say, good luck. And, uh, and that was a good position to be in, but it also has some, some drawbacks that we'll talk about. Um, I was asked to talk a little bit about sustainability, and that's kind of a broad topic. But uh, I kind of broke it down into a couple of categories we can talk about. Uh, renewable grants, categorical grants, uh, income producing activity and the sustainability statement. Uh, renewable grants are uh, the best way to have sustainability of a program, to keep a program going. There are certain categories of grants you can apply for that intend for you to reapply for them and keep getting the money into infinity. And, and examples of those are like the Violence Against Women Act provides a regular source of income for your um, battered women's shelter and other kinds of services like that to prevent violence in families. Uh, the Runaway and Homeless Youth Act gives a regular stream of funding to Sandy Rio and the, the Child Center where they do a Runaway and Homeless uh, Basic Center and he probably has a transitional living program and, and some other regular funding streams that they have. Uh, there's the Substance Abuse Treatment and Prevention Block Grant, which funds Aliviani and used to fund several other agencies as well. And the, uh, the HUD uh, gives a regular stream of funding for all the shelters in the city and for other services to homeless. Uh, that's the best way, if you can, you know, as your agency uh, looks for funding, to have a regular steady stream of funding that you know, you can always get that funding, that's really, Kind of like that's the cake you bake and then other grants can be a nice frosting on there those grants that come and go but it's good to have a regular steady stream of income <coughs> and uh, so let's talk about that a little bit more um, when you get your reapplication kit because usually you're competitive like once every three years and they will uh, and then on the interim years you just do a renewal thing that's not competitive but when you become, go into a, the competitive cycle, don't assume you're gonna be refunded and just copy paste your old grant into the grant narrative and turn it in. That can be a really big mistake because there's always some other agency out there that wants your money. And so if you wanna keep it, you need to write a really strong application. Uh, the first thing I usually do is I go through the whole application kit and I look for differences between last time I applied for this and this time. And I uh, carefully note all the differences because that'll be telling me what, what's new in the grant and what are they looking for that's different. And then when you go in and, uh, and write your grant, you want to be, you know, things have changed in the last three years. Did you implement any new uh, uh, research-based practices? 
which is a real um, important thing these days. Everything's got to be research-based, and it, your research-based practice needs to be, um, match up with the actual clients that you're serving. I had this, um, I read a grant where the, um, they put in a research-based practice that was a prevention program, HIV prevention for African-American women. And it was research-based, it had been proven effective, but they put the grant in for Hisp a Hispanic population with no explanation as to why they thought that would be appropriate. Things like that can look really out of place. So make sure when you put in your, uh, your agents, when you're putting in research-based uh, practices to put in your grant, make sure they fit your population. They fit the age, the ethnicity, uh, the type of problem they have, and all the other all the other little factors in that research that said this is what works and for who it works. Um, and also, I think I'm not keeping up to you. You're yeah. what? I think I'm not keeping up to where you want me. <laughs> no, go back, go back. Um, the database is real important. This is. This is one of the things that is going to be really hard for you if you're not the program person. If you're the grant writer, uh, but you're not running the program, how do you collect data on services that your agency does? Uh, you don't. You've got to work with the program staff and convince them to collect data. Now these days, with computers and technology and databases and all the different things we have, that make it easier to collect data in an agency. It's, it's not as bad as it used to be, but when I sit down to write a grant for someone, which that's what my business is now, I write grants. I have clients uh, all across the country and offshore as well in Guam and Virgin Islands. When I go uh, work with that agency and I ask them, they you know, okay, we're going to write this grant, and it's for your domestic violence shelter. How many clients did you serve last year? I don't know. Maybe 300. What do you mean you don't know? They don't collect data on their clients, and they can't tell you the race or ethnicity of their clients, their ages, what kind of problems did they have. Uh, and so it's really hard to write a grant when you can't demonstrate any knowledge of the clients that you're going to be serving. Especially if this is a renewal grant, you're, something you've had before and you haven't been keeping up on the data of the very services you've been providing. Um, so make sure that data is being collected on the number of clients receiving services, uh, the demographics of your clients, especially in a city like El Paso, we know it's primarily Hispanic, but they're also African American and, and Native American here. Uh, the ages of your clients, their income, and their problems. Uh, also, these days, uh, you really need to keep track of some other critical issues like veteran status, homelessness, uh, employment status, criminal justice involvement, and their education level. The reason I say that is because nationally you look for trends. What's the next new pile of money coming out? And what, what are our issues today? What's happening in the country today? What's, what's happening? Joblessness, unemployment, what else? Speak up. Increase in homelessness. Increase in homelessness. Mental health. Teen suicide. Teen suicide. What about uh, two wars coming to an end overseas? What are we, what, what's, what's happened? Has things changed while they were gone? And also when you have PTSD. So you can often find uh, a new grant that's somewhat like or has some of those services in it, and then you can just sort of re write a new grant. And it's unlikely you're going to get everything you had before, but you can maybe get parts. I, I'm working on a grant right now uh, that's uh, Veteran support, it's support services for veteran families. And it's kind of wide open, but it's uh, sort of like to prevent homelessness. But what, there are a lot of things that uh, cause homelessness among veterans. It's not just losing a job, but it's that PTSD, the relationship problems that end in divorce, and, and it's also um, employment and all kinds of issues. Well, the, this agency I'm writing it for is they're about to lose their employment grant for veterans, and they're about to lose a a grant for uh, doing specialized counseling with veteran couples to uh, reduce the problems of PTSD. 
So those grants are going to fold up right around the time this other one will come into existence. And so what we're going to do is try to fold those services in with all the rapid rehousing and other services of the larger grant, the new larger grant. And so, you know, just kind of got to shop around. And again, if you've kept good data and you know what your client's problems are and you know that, oh, say you're a, a, a health department, but if you've kept good client data, you also know that 40% of your clients are veterans. Veterans are a real large population. So, you know, you, you, the more you know about your clients and all their issues, uh, the broader range of grants you can apply for. Okay. Um, income producing activity. I don't really know a lot about this. I'd like to know more about it, but I've seen others do this and I think they're really smart because if your agency is totally funded by grants and you don't have any kind of side income, you're kind of living on the edge there, you know? So I know uh, that the Child Crisis Center has a thrift shop and uh, talking to their director, he told me that that pulls in about 200000 a year. People just donuts, donate stuff and they turn around and sell it. I mean, that's great, you know? And then that money is unrestricted. So if you do a grant, you can only do the grant services with that grant money. You can't spend it on other stuff. But if you have income, then you can spend it any way you want. You can shore up your other programs. You can start whole new programs. Uh, you can do all kinds of things. Hire another grant writer. Hire a grant writer. Good idea. Or contract with one. Um, uh, the El Paso Diabetes Association has really elaborate fundraisers. Uh, I get their, their emails. Um, all the time where they're telling me the next big fundraiser coming out. And I, I know they do a lot of that. I think fundraising in general is labor intensive and you maybe don't get as much money as you want, you know, but it's at least it's some other income. You can also charge fees for services. They're, they're maybe on a sliding scale or something, but a lot of times a grant lets you do free services. Well, maybe you can charge a little money and still keep doing them. Uh, one of the programs I'm working with now is they have a lot of clients that need childcare and they use the grants to pay the childcare, but now we're looking at starting their own child care center so the grant money can be used to pay cover, you know, through a voucher system, pay the child care for their clients. So the grant is paying for it into a child care center and once it does that, that money coming out the other end is unrestricted, you know, it can be used any way you want. And also income property, uh, I, I, I know a company that set up its own separate foundation for property. The foundation they set up buys properties and then the company, uh, when they get a grant, they need rent for office space or program space, they take a space in that property that their other foundation, that's only for them, bought and they, the grant money pays rent the rent goes into the other foundation. It's kind of money laundering, is what it sounds like. But then that money is available to be used for uh, unrestricted uh, costs. You know, so you just got to be creative and, and uh, think of other ways to uh, bring money into your program. Okay. Um, let's see. The sustainability study. Uh, every grant, almost every grant. It's got this little place in there where they say, tell us how you're going to sustain this grant when the funding lines up. And it's like, duh, you know, I, I'm not going to be able to, you know, then you're the only one, it's a categorical grant, you're not going to let me have the money again. And it's like an exercise in futility is what it feels like that you still have to respond to it. And uh, it, it describe your previous success in obtaining alternative funding for a project. Uh, that really works. Uh, and my, my example is that women's and children's program because we, we got a federal grant and, uh, and we did the women's and children's program and then the state picked up the funding and it, it created a steady funding stream. So that does happen and I was, I'm always using that as an example here. Um, <clears throat> you can list other possible funding sources like, well, you know, we're, we got this SAMHSA HIV outreach and testing uh, program, but when that money's gone, maybe we can get the CDC to pick it up, or maybe we can get the state health department, or 
or the local city county health department, ha ha. And uh, so, but you know, you give this list, you know, because it may be, you never know. Um, you might say that you're going to charge some fees for the services. You could say you're going to do fundraising, you know, like, uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't know how much money you're going to raise with that car wash activity, but on a federal grant that's usually around three hundred thousand, you're going to do a lot of car washes. Um, uh, foundations, you can say it, but usually foundations are small amounts of money, not large amounts. Uh, and also, you can point out the resources of the agency for writing grants. Um, and you know, like, well, we have a full-time grant writer, or we contract with someone, or you know, whatever, but usually you put this together as sort of like a combination thing. And you say, I was going to give you a sample, and give, so you have your boilerplate blurby to write up, and I thought, no, you need to learn to write. Um, <laughs> so, so you can, you can, you know, have you put together this paragraph, and you can, you know, just combine this stuff, and you can say, well, we'll try this, and we'll, we'll try that, and we'll do this, and, you know, and, and probably your best bets are that you're going to, um, do some cross-training with your staff so that the services carry on and that you've got collaborative relationships and you can get other agencies to pick up part of the services and that you'll try. But nobody expects you to, to for sure be able to refund that program. But you still got to, you don't want to get points deducted for not addressing it, so you have to address it. And uh, next, this is a, a, a sustainable a sustainability plan that uh, my friend Henry Brutus at EPDA sent me in an email and I thought well maybe it'd be interesting to you so I threw it in there and, and it's got some ideas in it to help you with that but it's the sustainability statement in the grant is never an easy thing because uh, it's it's just throwing darts, you know. And I've, I've written a nice one for each of my clients, you know, and I use the same one in your program. And if you, when we need to ask people what topics they particularly want to hear about today, sustainability is one of the big ones, and I, I know the very few grants that I've written, none of which have been funded, <laughs> but I've got things on sustainability by all of them, and I've heard that from quite a few of the people at various levels that we ask, and then they always say, oh, I struggle with that work, so thanks for Taking the time to address it, so I think it's a big issue for everybody. You're welcome. Well, now we'll go on to more fun stuff. <laughs> Getting organized. Um, I am a high production grant writer. I write lots and lots of grants. That's all I do most of the time. I write, I don't even know how many grants I write. Um, and uh, my batting average is about 70%. I get about seven out of ten, and most of them are, are are fairly large. It's a waste of my time to write small grants because you'll have to pay me as much as you're going to get in the grant. So uh, I have to. I'm kind of like on a schedule, and I've got to get through it. Grants have a deadline. You have to get all this stuff done, and you have to meet the deadline. I have never missed a deadline. Uh, you have to make sure that you get it done, and how do you get it all done and make it all make sense in the short amount of time they give you? When I read through the RFP, and some of them will give you like a hundred pages of instructions, and, uh, and then tell you to write a hundred page grant with a hundred pages of instruction, and I'm thinking, you know, how does this work? But you just have to make it work. Anyway, you don't have time to go back and reread that 100-page RFP over and over and over and over. So as you're reading through it, I take those little yellow sticky notes and I make tabs. And I write on each page as I'm reading whatever's on that page that's important that I know I'm going to need to go back to. I make a little sticky and I tab and running down the side. So I've got every page has got, you know, maybe five or six little stickies coming out, but it tells me what's on that page so that I can really quickly and easily go back to it. Um, I use highlighter for important information. She don't want to turn the whole page yellow, because then you lose the purpose of it. And you can even use different colors of highlighters, so that, um, you know, like uh, certain, you know, like anything to do with funding is in green, uh, stuff to do with uh, my instructions like uh, font, margins, the outline, the checklist, Stuff like that is going to be in yellow, and then uh, stuff for the evaluators in blue, and 
you get so you can, I can go through and color code it so I can go to stuff really fast and not have to reread. And uh, and then you're going to allocate the number of pages you're going to write for each section, and and you also need to allocate the time you're going to need to write each section. And I made a little chart for you. So when you look at the through a typical brand has got usually like uh, these four sections, a needs assessment, an approach section, organizational capability or management plan, something like that, and an evaluation. And it'll assign us uh, so many points to it. I, may, I did this to equal 100 um, so that it all works out real easy on your percent so I didn't have to bring a calculator. But uh, if that needs assessment is 20 points out of 100, it's 20%, so you see your percents. Then, if it's a 20-page grant, 20% 20 of the 20 pages is four pages. I can't tell you how many times I start to write a 20-page grant, I'm in the needs section, I'm all excited, I'm having fun, and all of a sudden my needs section is 10 pages. Well, that's not going to work, and I've spent a whole lot of time writing stuff that I'm going to have to delete. So you want to try to have targets for how many pages you're going to assign to each section. Uh, so you take those, if the points it's worth, you should have an equivalent number of pages for the points that section is worth. And uh, so then you kind of, and you make, and you do this, is you make your little chart and you write it in there so you know and don't forget. And then you, you've got two, say you've got 14 days to get that thing that, well, 20% of my time on those four pages for that needs assessment. It's, you just break it down the same way. 20% of the 14 days is three days on the needs, seven on the approach, three to the organizational capability, and one on the evaluation. Unless you're spin smart and you get Dr. Tomorrow got to write your evaluation. I give you a date or something else. <laughs> <laughs> and, and don't forget, that's just for the writing, but in addition to the writing, you have to do a lot of other background information, like getting those letters, filling out forms, getting your signatures. So it's not just the grant writing. Okay, grant writing is a team sport. And there's some stuff I'm going to tell you today that you've already heard today that has been brought up by Joe, and it's, and it's um, brought up by Eileen also. I got here kind of late. Um, if you hear it again, that means it's either especially true or especially important. Grant writing is a team sport. I write lots and lots of grants on all kinds of topics. I'm not an expert on a lot of topics. I'm a good writer. But I have been able to branch out and write lots of grants on lots of on. I mean, I have written grants for, uh, like, I worked in Ligiani for 10 years, so I know substance abuse and mental health. Uh, homeless issues and all kinds of issues up one side and down the other. I also worked for a real estate agency and a, and a rancher in New Mexico and I wrote grants on uh, recovery of endangered species and uh, environmental education for school kids and all kinds of things I had no clue what I was talking about. Uh, but you can do this. Uh, educate yourself. Um, and work with the staff that's going to be doing that program. In your agency, there are people that are going to have to do these services. They know things. They have expertise. This is their, their program, their area. So go in and, and you take your little grant and make a little outline of what the, what the uh, goals and objectives of the grant are, how much money it is, uh, what the services are that they're looking for. Make a little outline. Bring them together. You have a little brainstorming session. And, uh, and go over it with them and talk to them. And part of why that's so important, uh, when you write a grant, the funding agency wants to get the most bang for their buck. They want you to do a lot of stuff. They don't want to give you a half a million dollars to just do a little bit. They want a lot. But you also don't want to overcommit and promise so much stuff that it can't be done, and then you look like a failure. Who knows best how much stuff can be done? The staff that's going to have to do the work. So meet with them in advance. Go over the grant. Get their ideas. And the other reason this is so important is they can give you lots of insight to the clients you're going to be doing services. 
you don't, you're not the expert, you don't know, or unless you're the program person and the grant writer. But if you're just writing, uh, you need to have inside knowledge of the target population and what their problems are. And what kind of services are going to work for them. I, uh, back to that HIV grant outreach and testing, I uh, actually went out with the outreach workers to educate myself about the problems of drug addicts who shoot up drugs and put themselves at risk for HIV. I didn't have that kind of knowledge. I went to parochial school. So there are a lot of things I don't know. Uh, so I went with them on an outreach trip. We went to some seedy hotel uh, that was populated by um, transvestite prostitutes who were shooting up heroin. And, and it was, uh, I made my own little surveys so I could ask them questions and, uh, and filled out a survey for each one I talked to. But it was an experience uh, talking to men dressed as women with curlers in their hair. And uh, they were shooting up heroin in front of me and their eyes kind of rolling back in their head and blood dripping. And it was all kind of horrifying. But it really gave me the inside picture of what I was talking about. Because otherwise, you're going to write a sterile grant, you know. But if you want to write something that where the reviewer can really connect with what you're talking about, get out there, uh, see what's happening, talk to the staff, let them help you learn and get that kind of inside knowledge that'll bring your grant to life, mm -hmm. um, and let them help you develop it and tell you what kind of services are possible and what's not going to work. Like I remember in that grant, I had wanted to put in that we would do family services and work with the families of these uh, male to female <coughs> transvestites and, and they just laughed and they said, their family isn't going to come to counseling, are you kidding? Those pet ties were cut a long time ago. Uh, we're not going to do that, you know, we're going to focus on, but maybe we'll do counseling with your girlfriends or boyfriends. Um, so it, they can help you make it real. Um, you can also get them to help you with the parts that you need, uh, getting those letters of support, because those letters of support and commitment are coming from agencies that will provide ancillary services to the clients. The staff works with those agencies. When they need services for their clients, that's who they work with. They, they go to the hospital, they go to the clinics, they go to the places that provide other services to them, and they know that staff and they know those people, and they can get those letters. Whereas if you call them and you've never made contact with that agency, you're probably going to get blown up. Um, you'll also need to include resumes very often in your grant, uh, in an appendix, and uh, you'll need your, the staff that are going to be working on that grant, you're going to need their resume. Make sure they update the resume before they give it to you because it could be you'll get the resume and it's the one they use to apply for that job and it doesn't even include the fact that they still that they are working at this agency now. Mm -hmm. And their last job was as a truck driver and now they're an HIV outreach worker. Um, and they can also help you with those uh, surveys and collect data that you're gonna need. And then you can get someone to help you review the finished application. The review is at several stages. Some will help you with you know, grammar and spelling. These days, you don't really need that much help with that because your word processing program will do that for you. But they can help you make sure it makes sense and that it reads well and that it's smooth. And get someone also that uh, has that kind of, that expertise. Uh, a lot of times line staff doesn't have the, uh, the education and the research behind what you're doing. So get someone that's kind of up in your agency that's more professional staff to look at it also. I had a, I had a quick question for you. When you bring a staff <coughs> and you determine with staff that you might only meet maybe 80% of what the grant requires, and you said you might fall short of some of those things because you don't want to overcommit, is it wise to <coughs> say that in the grant? We might not, we, we can commit to this, but we can't commit to this, or do you want to you say you're only, like if the grant says you will do it, they give you five things, but you can only do four? Yes. Well, the grant, um, usually they say, like, here are the objectives of the grant, and they will tell you if all of these are required. 
they, it may be that you're only going to pick one of them. You know, so, so unless they say you must do all of this, do, 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 um, it could be that those are options and you can pick one or all or whatever mix you want. Unless the thing you're going to leave out is critical, you know, like if, if you say, well, we, we really don't want to do the evaluation. Well, you can't get out of that. You know, you're going to have to do that. But very often, the, the great instructions are going to tell you if you uh, must do all of these or if these are the possibilities. You know, you, you've got this team at your agency. You know, you may be able to, you know, ask the uh, accountant in the agency to work on the budget. You may be able to get someone in personnel to help you with job descriptions or some other parts. You may get someone to write, like, you may ask them to write a paragraph about uh, the, you know, the uh, scientific significance of what you're doing. But in the end, uh, if you're the grant writer and you're charged with writing this grant, it is your responsibility. And other people, you know, they've got work to do, they've got their programs, they've got their own job to do, and they don't really see it as their job to do your job. And so this is your job. You're responsible for getting it all done. And if they don't have the time to do they may say, yeah, I will, but you give them a little deadline. If they don't have it done, do it yourself, and then take it and show it to them and ask them if that will work or if they have any amendments to it because it's got to get done, and it just can't be left undone, and it's your job, so just do the best you can. Letters. Letters is a, always a really big deal. Um, you got to have them. Virtually every grant requires them. And you're going to ask, if you're, you know, like some agencies, especially the ones that live and die by the grant, man, they crank out the grants. You're cranking out grants all the time. This means you're over at other agencies asking for letters constantly. They get sick of seeing you. And uh, they may say, yeah, I'll do that letter and then blow you off and forget about it. Or they're just really busy and it's real hard to do letters. Start early, give a lot of reminders, and give them as much help as you can to get that letter done. And we'll talk about that here in a minute. There's two kinds of letters. Um, the grant will say they want letters of commitment or they may say commitment and support, or they may just say support. Commitment means that they are gonna provide services to you in that grant, that you're gonna get something out of them. Now, the services are usually things that that agency is already providing, maybe they're mandated to provide it, uh, they can't get out of it, you're, you know, they've gotta take your clients, same as they would anybody else. But that letter shows that you know people in the community, that you know agencies, that you're well versed in what's out there, and that you're connected. It's, this is part of your network. And so if, if, uh, if I say that the uh, health department is going to do counseling and testing with my clients, then I'm gonna need to have a letter from the health department that says they're gonna do counseling and testing with my clients. A letter of support means we like you. We agree with what you're doing. Yeah. So, <laughs> You know, letters of support can be really nice if, if, if it's from the mayor, uh, someone with some political power, because some things are politically driven at funding agencies. Uh, but by and large, what you're really looking for is letters of commitment, uh, where somebody's helping you. And all the services you outline in the grant that you're saying somebody else is doing them, you've got to have a letter that documents that that in fact is going to happen and that agency is aware of it and has a call to it. Um, rarely do you ask somebody to, I mean if somebody else is chipping in money or something, that's really cool and you better have a letter. Um, you can be really creative with your letters too and use them to extend the narrative. Usually you've got a fixed page limit uh, that can be really tight. And I appreciate page limits, because otherwise I don't know when to stop. And I'll just go on for forever. But uh, usually you're, you've got 20 pages, 30 pages, that's all you get. Well, you can use the letters, but especially when it comes to need in the community and where you, you just had to cut it off at that four pages, but you really like to say some more about the drug war and war is and how it's really affecting things and it's making everybody crazy and affecting your clients. And Well, get your people writing the letters to include their feelings or their observations on that and put it in the letters. 
And, and that way you kind of extend your narrative <coughs> that way. Um, <coughs> avoid cookie cutter letters. When, what you're going to find a lot of times is you're, the people you're getting letters from don't have time to, to write the letters. And so they're going to ask you to give them a sample letter. And so you write it up, and they take it, it comes in the email, they put it on their computer, print it on their letterhead, and they sign it. And then if you do that with everybody that's giving you a letter, what do you got? They all look the same. And I've seen them where even they all say they're going to be doing the same service. That doesn't even work, you know. Um, so sometimes you have to individually write the whole letter for the other agency. Change them up, make them different. Don't get, don't write exactly the same letter and then change the word, you know, HIV testing to training and conferences. You know, just you're going to have to, you're going to have to probably write those letters for them, and that's just kind of what it comes down to. Um, what I like to see in a letter is uh, a little short summary of that agency's services, because the the reviewer most likely doesn't know that agency. So they've got to understand, well, what, who are they, what do they do? So a little summary of what they do. We're the El Paso Health Department. You know, we handle all the infectious disease prevention and protect the health of the community. And then you want them to say what the services are they're going to contribute to the problem. We're going to do the, count, the uh, testing and uh, C4 counts for uh, people with HIV. and. And then also get them to include their contact information. If you have any further questions, here's my phone number. That individualizes the letter uh, and, and helps with that. Um, but you're, you're probably good. I also, one of the things you can do is write a cover letter and then the sample letter. In your cover letter, you can put what that, what you're trying to do with the grant, because you're going to have to tell them, they're going to, well, what are you trying to do? What's your grant about, you know? We can give them a cover page that says these are the goals and objectives of the grant. This is what we're trying to do. And uh, this is my deadline, and I have to have your letter by and give them a cutoff point and give them your fax number, and then call them, remind them. And it's okay to put a fax letter in your grant. You don't have to have the original in your grant. Fax is fine. Um, so, wait, go back to that. Um, yeah, the start early part. Call and nag. The, uh, you're going to have to nag to get the letters. It's just the way it is. It's not just you, Joe. Don't take it. I have to fix it. Organization tips. As Joe said, you know, they're, they're going to give you the 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 order the sequence of things uh, that they want to see in that grant they're giving you basically your headings the sections you're, you're required to submit and they'll also give you a, a, uh, a lot of other stuff there form 424 and then you have to have an abstract and you know there's going to be other kinds of forms other kind of attachments proof of your nonprofit status you know I mean they're going to have a list and they may even give you a checklist um, but I start every, you know, I'm, like I said, I'm production oriented. I start every grant making that list of everything in order that's going to have to go in that grant. And so I make the whole list, and it starts with whatever it starts with, and it ends with whatever it is. And uh, then, go to the next slide. Here's a sample of one. I, I, I uh, I make my list of everything that's going to have to be in there. And then from the table of contents down, all the rest of that, uh, I copy paste it onto the next page. So what I have then is each one of those becomes a page, you know, like that, that form, you know, it's going to have its own page, and then blah, blah, blah. Each one of them gets their own page because you're going to have to insert stuff there. And then uh, when I get here, this is where I start. you start writing, is at your project description, and you've already got some headings right there. And then, uh, so by copy-pasting it, I've already got my table of contents, and then I've also got all the stuff I'm going to have to put in there, and I won't forget anything. And you can even print that, pin it up on your wall there, and it's your, che your own checklist. And that way you make sure that you have gotten all the little elements that you need to put in your grant. 
in addition to the main headings that they give you, you're going to have subheaders because you've got to organize your stuff. Decide on a system of headings and subheadings. This has to do with that thing about making your grant have a presentable appearance so that it looks like a professional document. It looks like a technical document. You don't want to be shifting all over the place and, and, and uh, you know, a level one heading looks like the level one in one place and in some place else the exact same level of heading is looks like a level two. You know, you want to be consistent so that they can follow your organization and know where they are in space also. And it just and it, and it makes it look better if you'll have a system. So, you know, I uh, I will even write out um, my own little system of headings just like that. Because sometimes I'll have to even add in maybe a level five or a level six. And so you want to know, you know, you want to make it all look good and be real consistent. Um, and I write it out so that as I'm going through the grant, I can keep track of where I'm at and what those headings are supposed to look like. And usually your level one and level two headings are in your table of contents. And uh, there is a, on the word processing, on the, on dot doc, on the word, there's a function that will automatically generate the table of contents for you as long as you tag those headings as level one and level two using the little formatting tool. And then you go into this one little thing under insert. Uh, I can't remember exact path for it, but it's not that hard to find. And, and you just click on this one little button and there your table of contents magically appears. But make sure you're on the page you want the table of contents to be when you do that. <laughs> um, when you're uh, writing up your narrative, uh, these things can be real long. And you, you have to have some pity on the reviewers. Mm -hmm. So I want to organize your material and not make it to where they have to read page after page after page of really long <coughs> paragraphs that have no end in sight. It's just text, 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 text. If something can be logically put into like a little a little list, of, a little list one, two, three, four, five, or bullet points, or um, you know something to break it up and make it easy for them too. Maybe later they, they think, well, I, what did she say about that? Because they compare what you said later with what you said earlier, and they want to go back and find what they had read earlier, but now they can't find it because it's all in this long, rambling text. But if you put things in bullet points, it gives them a reference place to go back to and find things or uh, remember, oh, it was just before that list of bullets or it was just after. So it helps the reader to digest all this stuff. And have a system of bullets, just like you had a system of heads. Uh, you know, well, like this time I'm going to use little flower bullets, and the next time I'm going to do little arrows, and this time I'm going to indent them all, and now they're going to be flush left, you know. Get a system going so it all is clean and neat and tidy. Because that's it. You don't get points for appearance on your grants, but you make an impression. And it has to do with their opinion of you as you're reading it. And by giving them a good, a good appearance to your grant, it makes them think you're organized and professional. It just kind of sort of sets a tone. Okay. Oh, go back one. Uh, I forgot to. Color versus black and white. Uh, the grant is going to give you, they're going to say, yes, you can use color or, oh, it only has to be black and white. They're not going to tell you that, but there's clues as to what, to, to know this. If they say, don't uh, use any staples or anything on this, just put a binder clip or a rubber band on it and only send us a couple copies, that means when they get it, it's going to be mass produced on the Xerox machine. And if you have used color in that grant, just imagine a Xerox machine that's running millions of copies a day and running out of toner constantly, and you get those really ugly Xerox copies that you can only read part of it, or it's faded, and pages are wrinkled. Because they you know, mass, mass copy these things, and if you put color in there, and then they turn it into a not very good black and white copy, a lot of times it looks like crap. 
And especially if you've got little graphs and graphs in there where you're relying on color to be able to, you gotta have that little legend that says, oh, the red is this and the blue is that. And when it goes to grayscale, they don't know what you're talking about because they can't interpret the graph anymore. So if that's gonna be mass produced, they are not gonna make color copies for you. So when you prepare your grant, just do black and white or grayscale. Um, when you do a little chart, use stipples instead, you know, like slanty lines or polka dots or something, because that'll you can read that in the legend. Now. If they say uh, make 13 copies of your grant, hole punch it, put it in a binder with separator tabs, that means they are not making copies. You are providing all the copies for the reviewer, and in that case, have at it. You know, uh, color can look really good. Uh, I have worked with clients to develop a whole color scheme for documents where we make like a nice banner for the level one headings, nice watermarks, uh, and a color scheme throughout the whole thing for all the tables and graphs and try and tie the color scheme into the colors on their logo. And, and you know, so you can make, you can be very artistic. Don't make it look garish, you know, where it's kind of like over the top, you know, but you can do some really attractive stuff in color and, and make your document really stand out. And it's more fun, too. And you can put in uh, photographs of your clients busy doing things and fulfilling certain activities. Make sure you get uh, consent to include any client photos. <laughs> and um, some identifying information and a header of the like the name of the agency and the grant number, like the RFP number or the name of the program or something. So that way if the reviewer drops their pages and, uh, or maybe loses, maybe they don't get the 424 or they're reading and they forget which agency they're on, you know. They have this little reminder right at the bottom of what agency it is. You put, you know, the health department, El Paso, Texas or whatever. And make it kind of small, bold, and italic. And the reason I say that is, uh, the first time I put a, a footer on my grants, I left it as a 12-point font, the same as the other. And then it looked like I, it looked like it was part of the text. You know what I mean? There was no separation between the text and the footer, and it really looked kind of stupid. So if you make it small and dark, it can still be seen, but it's clear that it's not part of the text. Okay. Imagine the task of the reviewer. Your reviewers, um, if it's a federal grant, they usually uh, solicit reviewers from people like yourselves, professionals in the community. They used to bring us all to Washington, and we'd get to have like a reviewer party. And uh, you know, you're there for three or four days, and you read this massive pile of grants. You're usually reading three a night, and at night. And the next day, you sit in a group and review all of the proposals that you had read the night before. Reading three grants a night, you know, and each one of them is like 100 pages, that's a lot of reading. And uh, you get, you, you know when you read, even normally and you're having fun, you fade in and out of the text. You'll read something and then you go, what did I just read, you know? What, imagine what it's like for them trying to read all these boring technical grants, you know, and, uh, the other reviewers in the state, you got to really feel sorry for them because they have a regular job with the state agency and their supervisor comes in and says, hey, guess what? Leave your work behind. You're going in to review for a week. So, And, and guess what else? When you're done reviewing, your work's going to be waiting for you when you get back because nobody's going to do it for you. So <laughs> they're unhappy about reviewing as well because they don't get to go to the review with party. And it's, uh, so they're unhappy in reading drawing technical drawings documents. So you want to try to make it really easy for them. A nicely organized document makes it easy for them. And you can also very carefully use bold. In the instructions in the grant, they'll usually have like a two or three sentence telling you what they want included in the management capability section or the needs assessment. They'll give you some little explanation. Use the, say they say to you, um, tell us about your re outreach, recruitment, engagement, and retention policy. What, what are you going to do for that? Well, when you discuss it, take those words for each one of those discussions, the outreach, 
recruitment, engagement, and retention, and bold them so that they quickly and easily can go and make sure that the things they're looking for, because they got a little checklist, the, the things they're looking for, they can find them real easy because you're directing them to where it is. Now, that will at least get you points for having put it in there. That doesn't speak to the quality of what you had to say, but you won't lose points where the reviewer says it wasn't there. That has happened so many times that it's so frustrating when they say, well, you, you didn't address this, this, and this, and you know you did, and you feel like, I want to talk to you. I want to show you where it is. But it's just, you know, once they're reviewed, that's all there is, and you get, there's no recourse to it. So help them. Guide their eyes to, so that they at least know it's there. Um, don't overdo it. You know, you want to turn half your text bold. That's not, that's like, in, you know, in, when you see, send emails and you call caps, and then it's like shouting at someone. Well, that would be, if you put too much in bold, you're like shouting at the reviewer. So that's, that is a good help. Um, also, you notice when you write grants that you reuse material. You develop boilerplate as you're going along. You've written uh, your management, uh, the discussion of your agency. You know, you've written this a million times. You, you've got that ready to go. And you've bolded certain things to reflect back to what the questions were being asked. Well, then you go into the next grant, you pop it in there. Take the last bold out because you're going to be bolding. They're going to be looking for something different. So you have to make sure that it matches what the new grant is. Sometimes uh, I forget to do that, and that's when you end up with too much bold because it's got the bold from the last grant, and this one, and God knows how many past grants. Um, okay, so let's go. Um, when you're uh, making that decision about the services you're going to provide in the grant, you know, like you had brought up, you. You know, what if you're only going to do four things out of five? That's okay, as long as you're, usually in an agency, you know that there are a lot of things you want to be able to do. You've got a, like a laundry list of services you want to get some money to do, because you, you know, it becomes apparent to you over time you have needs, your clients have needs, the community has needs. Well, you know, maybe a grant comes out that sort of, fits what you want, but it's not a match made in heaven. That's the way it is. So you need to adapt your needs to what they're willing to buy. Because, you know, they're only, they'll, they'll offer you money for something that's where it's like mostly what they were looking for, but you can't stray off the path too much, and you're going to have to modify your needs to what they want to buy more than they're going to be willing to change what they want to buy to what you're trying to sell. And I, I you know, this is one of the problems when you have an executive director and the director says to you, the grant writer, dude, I want this, 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 and this. And you say, well, that's not what the grant says. The grant says this, this, and this. And I don't care if you're going to write it like this, you know. Well, then you don't get funded and whose fault is it? We all have our pet peeves. Um, follow directions. You can't emphasize that enough. Grant, grant writing is an exercise in follow that all. Uh, and and uh, it could, it's a something as simple as not getting a form signed. Uh, it could be um, if they said you will do these five things, but you only do four. If they say you must, then you must. But there are, if they say you're limited to 20 pages and you give them 21 pages, they could throw it in the trash and not even review it. Some of them are nice and say we just want to review any extra pages. 11 point aerial font, use 11 point aerial font. Don't give them a 12 point Roman numeral. Double space versus single space. Simple little things like that uh, can get you eliminated from, and you won't even get out the gate. Once you've answered the question, you've written your response for a section, reread the question. And, and I even, when I'm, right as I'm writing it, I reread the question. I probably reread the question 20 or 30 times to make sure I did not get off track. Because it is really easy to just 
you know, if you get your own things going, what you're excited about or what you want to say, and sometimes you go off this way, but the question really wanted you to go this way. And uh, this becomes really clear to you also as you get to a later section in the grant that asks you for the information that you put in an earlier one. Then you got to go back to that one and say, well, you know, I wrote all this stuff for this question, but it really goes over here. So what did they want here? If it wasn't this, it's got to be something else. So make sure you answer the question that's being asked. Uh, and it's, I can't, I've been a reviewer a number of times, and I, it just amazes me at how people don't answer the question. It's uh, a mystery. Okay. Then you'll get grants where they give you uh, the front matter introduction to the grant, and then they give you your uh, instructions. That's where it's like, okay, tell us your needs assessment, what we want here. And they may even have later sections that are review criteria. And they'll list a bunch of stuff under, and it may not even match up exactly with the, the instructions for writing the grant. They're off on their own thing. Uh, and they're, they're so, and you'll see differences. They're, and so, you know, well, which instructions do I follow? Which instructions do you follow? Joe says review criteria. You follow all the instructions. Even if it ends up where you can't follow, I mean, they may give you something that says follow Follow, here's how the order we want you to put things. Address these like this, and then the review criteria will throw extra sections at you that don't even fit the outline that they gave you. This stuff happens. You're just gonna have to make some new sections and stick them in there. You can't leave anything out. If it got given to you as an instruction in a later section, shoehorn it in there somewhere. You've gotta address it all. You can't ignore anything. Because you can't afford to lose points these days. You, you just can't. Uh, not over silly stuff like omitting something. Leave, if you're going to lose points, let it be that you didn't answer it the way a, uh, a reviewer wanted to hear it, but not for because something was missing. Okay. Um, writing grants on top. Oh, this is the word at the end. Am I on time? Yeah. Ten minutes. You Ten minutes, right? Oh, okay, good. That's good because I ran out of time. <laughs> <laughs> You're often going to have to write grants on topics you're unfamiliar with. I, 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 I think I've written grants on almost every, oh, uh, recently wrote a grant for my own company to the National Science Foundation um, to develop an uh, electronic reading tool for uh, autistic children. And uh, it's, it's, it's to develop a software that will allow you to convert any story into an electronic story with illustrations, sound effects, and the same kind of assistance a classroom teacher would give a, a kid one-on-one, -on -one, but it'll be a computer program game. Really neat. Today, this is the first PowerPoint I ever made. How did I do that? You know, how did I write a grant on technology? Well, I, I knew about reading and reading comprehension, and knew what I what I wanted the content to be. I didn't know anything about software, you know. So I got a this guy with a computer science degree to write that part, you know, and to put that part together. So. Look around you in this room. There are a lot of people here that know a lot of things. There are people in your agency that know a lot of things. You can consult with an expert that knows something and, and uh, figure out the stuff you don't know. I'm a good writer, and I'm open to learning, and, so, and I love to learn. So you can learn, too. And so don't be afraid. Don't be intimidated. Talk to people. Google it. The internet is amazing, you know. And if you put in a Google search and you don't get exactly what you're looking for, rephrase it. Mix the words around. Add a few words in, take a few words out. Keep keep trying a different search until you will hit bingo. You'll come up with the stuff you're looking for. Don't be afraid to buy a book. 
You know, if you're reading this, uh, your brand instructions, and they're citing literature that is the research behind the brand application, try to get a copy of that book. Uh, and you don't always have to buy new books. There are used bookstores, too. You can, you can uh, get a used copy for just a couple of bucks and build your library. But if you've got the, uh, a book that's the research behind the grant that came out with the money, then you're way ahead of everybody else, you know, because you can use the material out of that to develop your response. And, uh, and, I, I very, and especially if it's something that you know is gonna be an issue for a long time to come, like right now, I see veteran services as being something that's going to be a big deal for the next two or three years till we get all our soldiers back home and they get all resettled in. Um, so I bought some books on veteran services because I'm being asked to write a lot of those grants now. Uh, I have bought uh, books on um, environmental concerns and whatever it is I'm working on. You know, you can educate yourself and, and, get, and get the resources you need. Okay. And we have plenty of time for questions, so And I have water. And I just, uh, just basic question. When there is a page limit, I mean, since we know sometimes it's even different teams of reviewers reviewing different sections, is it okay to put in a different color piece of paper in between the sections to separate them so that it's easy to able to maneuver through your document? Your grant instructions are going to tell you, you're talking about when you submit it, mm -hmm. uh, your grant instructions are going to tell you, if they say 20 pages only, and uh, don't use any uh, staples or anything to bind it, that means they're mass producing at their end, and they don't want anything else. So. And then the other question is, when they give you a page limit, usually you know if the SF-424 part cover page is in In general, the, the, the page limit applies to the area. And if there if it's anything different, they have to tell you that. Okay. When you, you know, when we were talking about um, you can farm out different parts to write, if you've got a grant that has an evaluation section in it, and it has a good chunk of change for paying an evaluator to do the evaluation, have Dr. Tamaka or another evaluator that you know and respect write the evaluation. They'll write it for free as long as you give them the evaluation to do, and they get, they'll make their money later. Evaluations are really hard to write. Yeah, you know it. Any other questions? Can you give us uh, some techniques that you think are very effective for editing, uh, particularly self-editing? <laughs> Stay away from your grant for a day or two before you go back and read it for editing. Um, if you've just read it all the way through, and then you try to read it all the way through again, you assume you know what you're looking at. And you kind of skip through it because, oh, I already read that, I already read that. So if you stay away from it a little bit and then pick it up again, it's more fresh, then mistakes or inconsistencies will pop out at you better. I, I have one other, students ask that a lot. And I, when I work with students in student writing, learning to kind of review your own work from a third person's perspective is really difficult to be that objective what you said is exactly right. The other thing I tell them to do is read it out loud like it was a speech. Because if you're if you're reading the prose out loud and
and you're stammering and it's, it's difficult, it's not written well. If you can read it like a speech, it's usually in better, better shape. But again, even then, you, you start filling in the blanks yourself, yeah. you know, like is maybe missing, but you read it like it's there, little things like that. You were saying about uh, creating a solid database and trying to get as much information on, from your uh, clients as possible. How do you? How would you do that if you were working with, say, a hidden or much more stigmatized population that's probably a little more skittish than in giving personal information like that? Well, most agencies have got uh, like an intake form or some kind. You know, to be admitted for services, you have to provide some basic information. And that's usually the place to get like basic data on clients from. Um, but you aren't gonna be able, you know, and sometimes uh, a client, you'll ask them a question they don't wanna answer, well you skip it. You know, it, it also, if, if you can get, if you have uh, like a survey form where you're getting them to provide personal information, don't put their name on it, don't ask for their name. Uh, I was writing a, a grant for Louisiana on uh, abused, uh, abused, children that had witnessed or experienced violence. And these were the children of women who were in the treatment program. And we wanted to get an idea of uh, how many of these children had been abused, neglected, or, or traumatized. And it's usually parents. You know, it's, it, it was either gonna be the mother or her boyfriend who inflicted that. So in order to get the women to open up and provide that kind of information about what their child had been through, we gave them a survey with no names. So there was no way for that any, they, they wouldn't feel stigmatized because the name was, it was gonna be anonymous. So collecting information anonymously will get you more truthful information. Okay, and we have some really good data. I just want to point out that this is anonymous, that there is no name. Yeah. They may not, yeah, they may not be aware point. of it, they may not think about it. You can just tell, the front page, it's kind of that demographic person thinking that has no name on it, and they, they throw it out, and it's separate, they know that it's separate from the rest because sometimes you, you won't have a place for a name on it or anything. It's a parent, you don't put your name on it. No, I can not name it anymore. You guys are all ready to go now? Then we're going to try. <laughs> you mentioned homelessness. You've worked with homelessness. What are some of your favorite agencies or foundations that you found really impressive? For the homeless population? Most of the money for HUD, uh, for the actual housing part, because homeless has lots, it's, it's like you look through a kaleidoscope and it changes with each term, you know. The housing part, that money comes in through HUD. Uh, however, if, they ha if the homeless person, most people are homeless because of mental illness or substance abuse. And so if, if you're, the uh, SAMHSA provides money for the homeless as long as, you're providing substance abuse services, but they allow you to add in supportive services also. So you can put in their uh, money for, uh, you know, like uh, education or training for that person or supplies or other like helping kind of stuff or a case manager or other stuff. Uh, mental health has money like through PATH uh, for outreach to homeless. Um, Money for mental health services is getting harder and harder to get because there's so much mental health problem, you know, it's kind of overwhelming. And these days they only want to treat it with meds um, and not provide it with counseling. But through, I would say the state department, that department of state health services would be where we would get some mental health money. And, and then uh, employment and training services that would come in through uh, WIA. Uh, workforce Investment Act money that comes down through the real, real brand. What do they call it? Yeah. <coughs> and so you kind of, that's where if you got good data on your clients, okay, you know they're homeless, what else? You know, if it's a veteran, a homeless veteran, the, the VA has got grants where you can uh, get money to either construct or buy a building for transitional living. And then after you get the grant for the construction money, they'll pay a per diem of $30 a day for each veteran that's living in the program. Um, so you just kind of have to look at all the different problems of the person you're dealing with and money comes in from all different kinds of avenues. Uh, you can approach it from the side.
You're welcome. That's it? Good job. <laughs>